Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hello, Rhonda. Hi, David. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Mark. Hello, David. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, and welcome, everyone, to episode 275. Today, we have a really special guest, Mark Noble, who's a neuroscientist at the University of Rochester in New York State. Is that right, Mark? It's in New York State, isn't it? It is indeed. (laughs) And Mark's been on the podcast a couple of times before, and we wanted to have him on again because his expanded learning um, increases all of our learning about why team works on a neuroscience basis. And I think you've usually been on on some special anniversary of the podcast. I think your first podcast was our 100th podcast, if I recall. It was indeed. And that was probably with Feb Race, and we We did it at at Stanford, if I recall. That's right. Uh, Hmm. And then the one we did with you, do you remember which one that was, Rhonda? I don't. I should look it up. I'll look it up while we're talking. 167 or something like that. Oh, yes. It was the 167th uh, weekly anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me start with a really cool um, endorsement that someone recently sent you. I know, you know, we, you've written Feeling Good and your, your, your newest book, which is so awesome, Feeling Great. But somebody wrote you an endorsement about your book, Feeling Good Together, which happens to be one of my favorites as well. And she wrote <clears throat> a note of gratitude. I recently participated in a group led by Lori Cast, which was centered around your book, Feeling Good Together. I wanted to reach out and sincerely thank you for writing such an amazing practical resource. In a boundless sea of self-help literature, your book, Feeling Good Together, stands out as one that offers guidelines for mending and maintaining relationships that actually work. I also appreciate your candor your writing style, and all of the examples you provide in the book for applying the five secrets and what has worked and what didn't work for other people. It was an absolute delight to read. And while, as you rightly point out, accepting and responding to criticism may feel like a death to the self, we are indeed reborn in the next second to be better individuals, partners, and members of our communities. I've been using the five secrets course, not quite as well as I would like to, and I will continue to do so in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Burns, for your invaluable contribution to human flourishing. Best regards, Nadia. Nadia, well, thank you for that, Nadia, for that very, uh, very thoughtful uh, email, which I, I appreciate and certainly understand what you're saying and certainly agree with what, what you're saying. The, uh, the death of the self always sucks until you're dead and then it feels so great i screwed up the other day and the next day i had to call call up a a dear friend and acknowledge how badly i had screwed up and that i was feeling terrible about it and that i'd really kind of failed him and let him down and it was the most beautiful thing because he said, oh, I feel so much closer to you now. And, you know, it was, it was, it was just a delightful thing, but it's sometimes hard to ad- admit, you know, our errors and uh, it's kind of a, a blow to the pride. Uh, oh, by the way, Mark, I'm so excited to have you back. We haven't talked in an age. I, I talk to you all the time though. I've had many conversations about the self uh, which I know you didn't take kindly to the, that whole that whole notion, but I've reviewed our dialogues in my head and thought of uh, how fun it would be to talk some more when we're we're in person. But gosh, it's great to have you back on the podcast, and we got a zillion things to talk about. Tell us, 
what 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 you've been up to, and I know you've always you always have exciting new ideas. You've been doing all kinds of new things. You've been in, in Rhonda's Wednesday group, your small group leader. Uh, you're you know world renowned in in your own area of uh, you know cancer research and uh, uh, stem stem cell research, and it's just so exciting that you've taken a hankering to team and how team works through through the brain and, and stuff. So I'm I'm excited to hear what, what you've got to teach us today. Oh I'm I'm always excited to spend time with the two of you. It's it's such it, it's such an odd time that I have such a wonderful group in my lab and we're making such interesting discoveries. And and I, I go in feeling in the lab like like this is the best science I've ever been engaged on. And the work on understanding team therapy as a part of that, mm. it, it not only does it you, like your like the person whose letter you read uh, said it, it it helps me become a much better mentor, member, better member of the community by understanding this, but it's also opened up all sorts of new problems to me in mm. terms of of thinking about. Things like the uh, mo- the molecular biology of, of stress and things like this, but but the reason why we're talking together is because of the, the journey that started the first time I met you, David, of uh, of sitting there when you showed the 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 film of of Karen, whose daughter had been uh, shot in the mouth with an air rifle and who had gone through ten years of misery with no help and seeing her change in two hours. And I, I remember clearly her saying at the end of it, what the hell just happened? Yes, I remember and, that. And that was exactly what I was sitting there thinking. And since then, it's been such a, a delight to try and figure out what is going on. Because the only way the team therapy can work that way is because it is beautifully aligned with how the brain works. So what does that mean? What can team therapy teach us about how the brain works? What can understanding brain function teach us about why team therapy is so special and so different and whether it's possible to to have other ways of thinking about it that, that actually make it easier to learn why you do certain things. And 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 Rhonda, with, with your gracious invitation to allow me to take part in the Wednesday group and be a small group leader, I've had so many opportunities to, to try out how to explain things from a, a brainological point of view. Mm. And it's it's uh it's marvelous how how often it it clicks and people just say, Oh yeah, okay, now I understand that. Mm. And and then the main thing that brings us together today is that I I think we've, we've said before that that I have been working on a book about team therapy and along the way of doing this I decided to spend time writing a brief patient guide. The goal is to have something probably it's going to be about thirty pages illustrated with. Um, that, that brings together the perspective of brain function and the steps in team therapy to be made available to every patient everywhere in the world for free for every therapist to modify, to translate however they wish for free and just follow the marvelous tradition that you have created of making free resources available. And That's fantastic, Mark. It's like the Wikipedia of team therapy. Kind of, kind of like that. It, it, it actually it is. And the we've shared it with fifty people. The feedback has been wonderful and um, very, very positive. Some lots of good suggestions um, that I'm incorporating now. So by the time this is available, we can make this available with the podcast, and people can just download it and. We'll send it out to everyone in the team community and hope that it's it's helpful. And then that'll be followed by by other guides. But let's 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 yak about 
what the what the brain does because I'm, I'm so curious about y- your thoughts about the 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 directions that I've been taking and how how you see these pieces fitting together. So how, how would you like to do this? How should we how should we go about this? Well, there's uh, many many pieces, but two practical pieces that that I just maybe a small portion of a huge piece of pie is if if people uh, what uh, t- just can you tell us kind of how this would be used by by patients what what what's in it for them to to get your guidebook and and to read it what because uh, I think uh, brief brief guides and you know, step by step things are. Are, are very very helpful to people, and then if if some of our listeners, and I'm sure many of them will, want to get access to to this uh, free gem, uh, how how would they do that? And by the way, I want to thank you for your brilliant work at the Pesky Talk the other day. We had over seven thousand people register for that. They didn't all come live. A lot of them would be listening to it afterwards. But it was I. I looked at that massive list of questions, and there you were, practically answering every third one of them, or you know, a tremendous number of questions. Which uh, I, I'm just so grateful and appreciate your 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 doing that. But t- tell us about the. Uh, you know what what's going to be in this this guidebook, and and how how would people sure. download it. Sure. So the, the, the guidebook actually started with a conversation that came up with Rhonda with, with the Wednesday group. I don't remember whether it was the whole group or the small group that I lead, but I think it was the whole group where someone pointed out that a lot of their patients were very confused by the differences between team and other types of psychotherapy that they come in with a, a, an internal story about how psychotherapy works, and all of a sudden they're, they're in a new world. And I asked whether it would be useful to have a guide that you could give to every patient when they come in to get, get them set on the team journey. And the response was very enthusiastic, so I settled down to doing that. And that guide has it starts with in, an introductory section on what the brain actually does how does the brain work because this is what not only helps you understand why team is so special but when you understand how something works that increases your flexibility in how to use it so there's a bunch of very specific questions that people have been asking me we are having this this brainological perspective, as I call it, um, gives an answer that that is is quite understandable, and, and we'll we'll get to to some of those. So that was that was the genesis, and then the, there's a section on on how the brain works. It's not written for a neuroscientist; it's written on a on a ninth grade reading level, and it's written with a minimum of jargon. And it's just, what are the basic principles of how how this marvelous organ in our heads does its job? And then from there, a 10-step sequence through the 10 steps of team therapy. And at each point to say, okay, this is what you're going to do. This is how it fits with brain function. If you're having trouble with it, this is how you can do it better. This is how you can make it more effective. How you can make the brain more effective. Yes, how you can make the brain how you, and how you can understand what you're trying to do. So, so for, for example, um, and this is going a bit out of sequence, but it's a good example of what I'm trying to do. One of the questions that comes up, and I'm sure it's come up for you many times, is when you're working with Feeling Good or Feeling Great or any of the other books, you have a paradox that in in team therapy, we say that empathy is essential. Yet, empathy is something we think of as happening with another person. So how do you fulfill the empathy part of the interaction with someone when you're sitting there reading a book? Well, part of it is that 
we, we do that through communication, right? That's why we love to read books and go to movies and we're moved by music and paintings and, and your books have tremendous empathy in them. You're clear you really care about people and you tell these wonderful stories. Yet when I looked at it from the point of view of brain function, there's something else there that seems critical, which is that empathy, yes, it's about establishing the therapeutic relationship and being in a safe space so that you are not in a constant fight or flight reaction and being able to share what's troubling you without feeling judged by it. But Team therapy is all about learning new ways to think. And we know that to optimize learning, there's two things that you need to do. From the point of view of the nuts and bolts of brain function, you need to activate the specific nerve cells that you're trying to change. And how do we do that? We do that with language. So how do you know that a, that a network of nerve cells is active? Well, you talk about it. The other thing that's very important in learning is attention. You have to be paying, you have to be alert and you have to be paying attention. So what the empathy section does is it's activating pathways. It's making you alert. It's making you focused on them. So when you ask the question of, well, gosh, but I'm just sitting here, I'm working with this book at home. How can I do that? The answer becomes kind of obvious, which is write yourself a letter or write David or Rhonda a letter. Write what you would say if you could have that conversation with your future self or your past self or these wonderful therapists who you're meeting through the podcasts. And you will achieve that exact same function of activating all those nerve cell networks that you're now gonna learn how to modify. And what seems like a difficult problem becomes something that when you look at it from the point of view of brain function is, oh yeah, that actually, that would work. And there's a lot of studies that writing about your emotions is itself helpful, but doing that is also gonna set you up for the next steps of the daily mood look. So that's, so that's an example of, of the way these, these ideas fit together. I love that example. So, so you're writing yourself a letter, you're writing a letter to yourself, being empathic to yourself? Well, I, I, I'm viewing it from the point of view of what, what you, you have taught me about empathy, which is the add zero concept. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what I would say if I were if you were my therapist and we were talking together right now, this is what I would want you to know about me. Even, even to the point of then reading it at the end and asking, did I miss anything? Giving myself a grade. There's so many benefits of this because our brain can only, we can, in our active working memory, there's so many studies that show that we can have between four and maybe six or seven things in our active memory at one time. If you write them down, you don't have to keep them in your active memory. Hmm. They're there. They're there in front of you. And you can refer to them whenever you want, but you don't have to try and remember them all the time. So you take that stress element out of it. You have something that you can revisit to look at how you're changing in your views of what's happened. And I think there's a beautiful metaphor to it. We, we, we think in terms of metaphors. The, uh, the, the cognitive linguist at Berkeley, George Lakoff and, and his colleagues have, have studied this extensively. And, and I think the current view from their camp is that almost all the thoughts we have are, are based upon metaphors that we often ones that we learn very early. So there's a beautiful metaphor of writing, which is you're taking these things, which can be very troubling. I mean, many people have had horrible things happen to them. And you're taking them outside of yourself. They're not inside you anymore. They are metaphorically down on the page. Why is that important? Because 
in our thoughts, in our brains, in our world, nothing exists except the activity of our nerve cells. All of our interpretations of the world are the activity of the nerve cells. All of our horrible memories, all these things that may have happened that trigger a, a, a rapid fight or flight response that we have no control over because something awful happened to us, that awful thing isn't happening. What's happening is the memory of it. And a part of our brain that is that works to protect us, the limbic system, doesn't do a good job of distinguishing between the real world and the imaginary world. So you remember these things, and we all know that. We remember these things, and we are emotionally set off down a particular pathway. By taking this and putting it outside yourself, I think there's an element of being able to look at it and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is what happened in the past. It's not happening now. And that gives you a freedom because we, we, never, we don't, certainly don't condone, we don't, and I don't even believe that anyone needs to forgive someone who did someone awful to them, although there is a, a, a beautiful Buddhist and Amish and Quaker and other religion view that forgiveness is, is a great thing to way to free yourself, but it's to take away the power from whoever harmed you that's so important, to remove their ability to influence your emotions. And this is part of that process. But there's many more things that, that go on in a team therapy session to move that along. But that's that's a that's a starting point for it. By forgiveness, you take away the power of the person who harmed you. By forgiveness or by just taking it outside of yourself and saying, they're not here right now. They could be dead. They could be on the other side of the world. Wherever they are, they're in the past. All that's happening right now is nerve cells firing in my brain. Mm -hmm. and, so it could be the same thing with the daily mood log. Could have the same function, or just writing well, down a description of what happened. Absolutely, I think the daily mood log. I mean, I, I you know, I have a very. Uh, obviously a very positive view of, of team therapy, but I, with everything that I, I study, and, and, I, and I don't, you know, I don't mean this, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke at you, you know, I just, I think this is a cold analytical thinking process. I have to say, the more I understand about the daily mood log, the more I've come to feel that it is one of the most brilliant inventions in the history, certainly in the history of psychology, and maybe beyond that. It, it is so sophisticated in its depth and what it accomplishes. And that's in, all in terms of brain function. So I'm, I'm really anxious to share those, those, eager to share those thoughts with you and with, with the listeners, because that's also shoot, part of the guide. Shoot. Yeah. It's exciting what you're saying. Tell tell us more. Rhonda has an important question at this point. Well, I, I was just going to say that what you're talking, <laughs> you know, you, you threw me off, Mark, when you, that, that um, description of the daily mood law, of course, you know, in some ways it's super simple, you know, the steps that you take. And in other ways, it's, it's complicated and it, you know, complex and it brings depth to therapy for, you know, um, you know, to get to the, so that people can challenge their, their negative thoughts and move on. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear why you think it's so important in terms of brain functioning. Well, well let's, let's look at, at how we, we go about the daily mood log. So you start out by circling your emotions. Okay. Well, you well, start off by picking a specific moment in time. Start off by picking, ah, so let the, yes, great. Let's back up to that. Cause that, that itself is fabulous. You say this, and this is part of this issue of team therapy being so different. So we're going to work on a specific moment in time. And the person you're working with is sitting there thinking, are you kidding me? I've been depressed for 30 years. I've got this mountain on my back. And you're telling me we're going to work on one moment and that's going to fix everything? You people must be crazy for <laughs> star attempts or just complete flim-flam artists. Mm. The thing is... 
it's an absolutely accurate description of how the brain works. Mm. We, you know, the estimates are that we have, you know, people throw around numbers like we have about a, a hundred billion nerve cells in our brains. That's an amazing number. The estimate is that there's only been 107 billion human beings that have ever lived on this planet. So in each of our brains, there's as many nerve cells as there are people who have ever lived on, the, on planet Earth. And each of them can interact with a hundred or a thousand or more other nerve cells, which have these trillions of interactions going on in our brain. How in the world do we deal that, with that? If we're in a room where 10 people are talking at the same time, we can't possibly figure out what's going on. If you go to your desk in the morning and there's 20 things in it that you've got to work through in order to get started on the day, you're, you're kind of lost. And yet we zoom right in. We can focus, we can be very, very specific. And that's partly because nerve cells are organized into networks of things that are functionally related to each other. And we call those functional relationships, if you're in the George Lakoff world, you call them frames, but they're, they're stories. They're, are, we are storytelling species and we organize all of our thoughts in, in terms of stories. Okay, so... What is you're saying that it's easier for the brain is tell me if this is accurate. It's easier for the brain to focus just on one specific thing than the hundreds of billions of things that we could focus on at any one time. It's, it's the only way it can work. So, so there's this brilliant work by the, the um, psychologist Daniel Kahneman and then the late Amos Tversky on, on what they call fast thinking and slow thinking. Fast thinking is 98% of what we do. It's stuff we know. It represents networks that are already connected to each other. Slow thinking is the analytical stuff. It's when we're trying to solve a new problem. We don't do much slow thinking. Slow thinking takes a lot more energy. Fast thinking is what gets us through the day, because most days we don't have to do anything new. But it's more important to think of this in terms of evolution. In terms of evolutionary history, we weren't worried about solving a math problem or how do we get to, how do I get Zoom to work so I don't make a fool of myself talking with the two of you. We were worried about, am I going to be a meal? And you needed to react quickly because that ability to respond immediately could be the difference between being a meal and surviving. So that's what brains are built to do, to respond quickly. We humans have these, this wonderful cortex and particularly this wonderful prefrontal cortex that are so important in doing the slow analytical thinking of solving new problems, but we don't engage it that much, partly because, you know, it's like water running along, running along the ground. If there are pathways for the water to run into, it takes the pathways that exist. And we do the same thing in the brain. We, it uses less energy, and, and it really does use less energy. It turns out our brains use 20% of the energy of the body, and when you do slow thinking, you use 20% more on top of that. So we, when, when, when you feel like you've been doing hard work thinking a lot all day, yeah, actually, you're using a lot more energy. It actually is really tiring. So anyway, so you, when you pick a moment in time, you are beginning this shift to slow analytical thinking. What, what moment am I going to pick? Why is that important? Slow analytical, analytical thinking is the key to understanding how to change what you think. If all you do is what you already know how to do, you're not going to learn anything new. You've got to start thinking in a different way. So let's make a simple example. Let's say that you learned that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And every time you do a math problem, that's your basis for thinking about it. And you're going to get the wrong answer all the time. And then finally, you learn that two plus two doesn't equal five. It equals whatever, whatever it equals, seven or nine. I don't, I don't remember. Oh, four. That's right. So <laughs> two, plus, two, two plus two equals four. And now you can do all these, these math problems and get the right answer. Now, you've created a new network of nerve cells. You've modified the network that was wrong, 
and you've turned it into a network that now has accurate information. You can remember that you used to think that two plus two equals five, but now you've modified it to get the right answer. That is the key, I think, to understanding team therapy, that you are taking a network that's not giving you the right answer or set of networks that are not giving you the right answer, and you're introducing modifications. And the steps of the daily mood log are the steps in doing that. So first, you identify your emotions. You're using your visual system. Turns out, in humans, the number one way, the most effective way to activate your attention and your focus is through the visual system. So right from the get-go, if you wanted to design a way to do this, it wouldn't be by just talking. It would be by having these visual cues that you're going to use. And of course, the daily mood journal is based on writing, which involves your visual system. So you're really focusing your attention. Okay, now you have a problem to solve, which is what are the negative thoughts that the feelings come from? Well, that's a curious question to ask for most people. And there's no greater motivator of learning than curiosity. You've set up the curiosity of, we're going to solve this by talking about one moment. Oh, and now you're going to challenge me to figure out what you're saying that my thoughts cause my feelings. And what are my thoughts? Well, I don't know what my thoughts are. But we learn this. We figure out what they are. And these are clues to those internal stories we have that represent our rapid thinking pathways that tell us how the world works. It's how we perceive the world. For someone who comes in for therapy, for example, they probably come in with a story of, oh, I'm broken, I have this biochemical imbalance, and I need drugs, because they're flooded with that information. Team therapy provides a very different story, which is that, no, actually, that's not accurate. There are other ways of thinking about this and working that are way more effective. Okay, so now you've got your clues. You're on your, you're on your path of your detective story of trying to figure out what's going on. What are you going to do about it? And now we get to some of the, the deep brilliance. Positive reframing. Okay, now I... David, we've talked about this so much. You've talked about this so much. And the way in which you came to do this and realizing that it's more effective. But why is it more effective? Well, if you think about what our brain is trying to do, it's trying to interpret the world. If we can interpret the world, we can make predictions. And if we can make predictions, we're more likely to stay alive. So our internal stories help us make predictions. If you jump in and start identifying cognitive distortions, you're mucking about with the ability to make predictions. It's like you have a chair with four legs on it. An essential one of those legs is the ability to make predictions. If your predictions are based upon all these cognitive distortions, there's still your ability to make predictions. With positive reframing, you're basically adding another leg to the chair. You're stabilizing it, but you're doing more than that. You're changing the internal story. You're changing the internal story from, oh my God, I'm, I'm so broken. I'm so defective. I'm a loser. I can't do anything right. To, wait a minute, there's all these good things about me. And I, I love watching sessions with people because as you go through this, they're starting to smile. Their whole body language is changing, right? You're out of your, yes. you're out of your head. It's, it's a marvelous thing. They're seeing ways of thinking about themselves. So it's, it's like the first way is like being in a funhouse mirror that only shows you terrible things about yourself. And now moving to a real funhouse mirror that's actually really fun, where you see all these wonderful things about yourself. Your internal story changes. So that's pretty neat. And that now makes it possible to go forward and identify cognitive distortions without feeling 
oh my God, I'm such a screw up. I'm just thinking about all these things in all these distorted ways. It's, wait a minute, I have these other things going on in my brain that are really good. There's all these good aspects of me that I'm now identifying. Oh, and I'm writing them down because in team therapy, you write them down. So you're learning them and you're focused on them and you keep going over them and you keep asking people, well, why is that a good thing? And why is that a good quality? And do you really believe it? Well, you're using these basic principles of learning, of repetition, and of doing things in multiple ways, and of discussing things. So it's not just that you're modifying a network about a specific thought you have, you're learning a skill. Just like learning to play a musical piece on, on, on the piano or the guitar, Yes, you learn to play that specific piece, but you're learning all these skills that help you play other pieces. Yeah. So now you go forward from that and you say, you know, our brains are pretty wonderful. They really are. It's amazing that, that what they enable us to do. But there's a lot of things that our brains do wrong. We all have a lot of thinking that's full of errors. What happens in anxiety and depression is that that happens more, but we can figure out what those errors are. And so we call them cognitive distortions. Oh, and here's this list that you can look at so you don't have to remember them all. They're there right before you. And once again, you're using your visual system, you're focusing your attention, and now you go through for each negative thought and identify cognitive distortions. And you write them down on the page. And in fact, it's not just that you write them down, you think about abbreviations. So you're like creating these little acronyms to help you remember them better. And after you've gone through this a number of times, you've learned how to do this. And then something magic starts happening. And, and this is what I think is, is the, the core of understanding why team therapy is possible. You know, one of the things that I'm sure that, that you're asked all the time. And I know that when I chat with people about team therapy, it's probably the number one question that comes up. Someone has been depressed for five or 10 or 20 or 30 years, and you're telling me rapid change is possible? Come on. I mean, it took 30 years to get there. How can you get out of it in 30 minutes or two hours or you know, a few weeks. So. To you, the, the email I got after the uh, podcast with Sarah, who no. uh, you recovered like in three minutes from 20 plus years of severe OCD, like what Howard Hughes has. And uh, uh, most people get very excited to hear that. But what one fellow just wrote, F you. <laughs> it, really, it ticked him off pretty pretty intensely and there's you know a certain sector of people who get enraged really by the idea that rapid recovery could happen it's like you're trivializing my my suffering and mm. uh but continue with what you're saying it's such an important point that you're on right now well it's it, 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 you know this and, and you and you mentioned something that's also it's so important that I, I want to take a moment to focus on it. There is this history that goes back a very long way in, in psychological challenges of a segment of the community that says, oh, just get over it. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah. You, know, just, you know, pull yourself together. You're just making it all up. And the counter view to that that has played, I think, a good role in understanding the, the, the importance of these of these emotional challenges is the view that says, oh, no, you're broken. You have biochemical imbalances or these terrible things happened to you when you were young and all these deep things that have to be figured out. Slowly. Slowly. So there is this question about a misunderstanding, I think, about team therapy that's frequent, which is, wait a minute, are you just saying just get over it? No, no, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that a great example of this is ulcers. 
People is what? Trying, is ulcers? Is ulcers. People were trying to figure out ulcers for years and put people on these special diets, you know, drink a lot of milk and don't eat spicy foods. And, oh, they're all emotional and you've got to learn to calm down. And people were really not having much success in treating ulcers. But a lot of money was being made with all those antacid pills. Boy, <laughs> sure, sure was. And what changed? Somebody asked the right question. They said, you know, I think that a lot of these are bacterial infections. I wonder if I could treat them with an antibiotic. Well, it turns out that a lot of this stuff you can just treat in a few days by taking the right antibiotic. They asked the right question. And I think the brilliance of team therapy and why... I say it's so aligned with brain function, is that it asks a series of questions, goes through a series of steps that are basically the functional equivalent of doing that. It's using this wonderful tool that we have to probe the brain, language. That we, you know, you can put people in magnets to look at um, changes in brain function and all these other wonderful things that we can do. There is nothing more beautiful and specific than language. Nothing. So that's what we use. We use it in these beautiful, specific ways to think deeply, think analytically about the way we're interpreting the world. So now, what's happening? Well, this is something where I have a modification of the, the standard view of CBT and stoicism and analytical meditation and all these sim similar approaches. Okay, so what do we say? We say events happen and then we interpret those events. And then from those interpretations, our emotions are generated. That's kind of the core summary of cognitive and behavioral therapy and all these earlier philosophies and approaches. But there's more to it. Yes, the brain does that, but there's step four, which is, did I make the right interpretation? There's a quality control step. That's critical because if you are out in the wild and you smell something and you go, oh my God, it's a tiger, and it turns out to be a kitty cat, well, you know, you're a little embarrassed, but it's fine. But if you smell something, and you say it's a kitty cat, and it turns out to be a tiger, yeah. you're now that tiger's dinner. So we have a quality control step. And I hate it when that happens, too. Don't <laughs> God, that's <laughs> tigers. <laughs> the worst part about it is, you know, when I get bitten by a tiger, it triggers a rage reaction in me. And I sometimes bite them back, and then I feel so ashamed. <laughs> no, yeah. and, particularly, and particularly when you love cats so much that it must be it must be very disturbing for you to have that adversarial reaction. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, we do the quality control, and if the brain decides the interpretation is wrong, it gets a new interpretation. Well, why do we have emotions? That's what the brain does to motivate us to act in accordance with our interpretations. So your emotions. Wait, wait, Mark, say that again. Say it again. Why do we have emotions? Emotions are motivations. Emotions move us towards something. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but not that much. Emotions move us towards something or away from something. If you think about it from, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, what do we want to do? We want to move away from something that's going to hurt us. We want to move towards something that's going to be a mate or is going to be nutritious going to be a safe place and with only a few exceptions emotions are very much like that they are a movement away from something or a movement towards something there are a couple of exceptions that are really interesting but so so when you change your and this is the course the hearted team when you change your interpretations you change your emotions but what i view this as is that that change in interpretations is what the brain does. And what team therapy does is it taps into the quality control mechanisms. That's what all the team therapy is about. And how do you do quality control effectively? You use your slow analytical thinking to take things apart. Was that a good interpretation or not? 
You can do that with rapid thinking. And for course, you know, for millions of years of evolution, that's almost certainly what happened. But we humans are able to do it in a different way mm. and say, mm, okay, wow, you know, I've done, now done this daily mood log and there's all these good things about me that are revealed and there's all these cognitive distortions. Well, we don't have to do much else because the brain is looking at all this and you're getting it in visual input and you're talking about it and the brain's doing the quality control stuff and it's going to flip. Why? Because the odds of survival are dramatically increased if you make predictions based on accurate interpretations. That is just fundamental biology, right? You make your interpret your predictions based on the wrong interpretation, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. You make your predictions based on the right interpretations, odds are much higher that you're going to survive, or you're going to get a good meal, or you're going to be friends with someone, you're going to get a new mate, all these good things can happen. So that's what the brain is just built to do. Yeah. And then you have the methods. Oh, the methods. How I love the methods. <laughs> that our, our brains or our life experiences are all so unique. And the idea that there is a way that works is it's so endemic in 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 medicine and psychology and in so many fields. And the, 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 your emphasis, David, always that team is not a school of therapy. It is taking what works, whatever it comes from, and saying, let's use it. I mean, that's science, right? When I go into the lab, I don't worry about whether I'm, I'm using a technique that comes from some school of biology or some other school of biology, all I want to know is whether it works or whether it's useful. And people are different, so you need different techniques for different people. But all of those methods do one thing. They set up the quality control comparison. Huh. doesn't matter what method it is. That if it's externalization of voices, with one person taking the negative position and the other the positive position, it's setting up that argument so that the brain can put it in balance. It could be through a double standard technique of what would you say to me if I was your identical twin clone having the same problems? It could be through this wonderful technique that we just learned in the Wednesday group, the medium technique of talking with a departed person who you missed so, so greatly and who you need to have an interaction with to move forward, or doing cost balance analysis, or any it, every technique that I look at, every method that I look at comes down to making it easier for the brain to do these comparisons. By the way, speaking of methods, um, I think I've I forwarded a Sasha's picture of her two babies. No. The hidden emotion? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't forward that to you? The pictures, the photos of her newborn I don't baby? I the photos of the babies. No. And, and how the two are, are interacting. And she says that she's just been totally, absolutely no anxiety on any front since, since that day. And I remember that day. That was one of my visits to Stanford. I remember yeah. the session. Yeah. But we oh those of us who weren't in that moment with you guys don't know what you're talking about or who Sasha is. Or it, it wasn't Sasha. I can't remember her name, but she's in feeling good. She's the one in a Tuesday group. I don't mean to dis distract us, but it was such a great thing, was having all of this anxiety. She had one baby, uh, she and her husband, and when uh, the baby became four, they were going to have a second baby. But then all of a sudden she started having like panic attacks and anxiety what if I have a, a, a baby, a second baby, it'll probably have some horrible defect or something and, and it's going to kind of ruin our lives. But, but then if I don't have a baby, the baby we have will probably die mm -hmm. and then I will have no babies. Mm -hmm. And she had all of these distorted thoughts and fortune telling and all these, you know, disturbing illogical messages she was giving herself, like what you're talking about uh, Mark, uh, you know, making just grossly 
unrealistic interpretations of of what was going on but then it turned out to be the the hidden emotion thing that underneath she was kind of angry with her husband for not ha- helping out enough with the kids and when yes, that came you're... go ahead mark yeah and i and, and i i remember when you when you said that when when you 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 very gently said you know i i'm looking back at the brief mood survey and you know, we haven't, you have some dissatisfaction in your relationship scores here. And I wonder if we should, we should talk about that a bit. And she leaned forward and her eyes opened wide. She said, yes. And well, boy, that was a clue that things are going in the right direction. And, and I think that that's something else that we see, see a lot that when you tap into the story that's really important, focus and attention change, the emotional tone changes, the engagement becomes total, because now you're really working on on the deep problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that was was a wonderful session. It was just so neat. And and then when she brought that to conscious awareness, talked it over with her husband, not only did all of her fear of having another baby just disappear, she said all of a sudden her fear of flying disappeared. It, it just had this profound effect. And often uh, anxiety is just uh, bottled up emotions that you're not expressing because you're too nice. And it comes out as panic attacks or phobias or, or whatever. But it was such a rewarding thing. Well, I'll, I'll, do you remember? I can't remember her first name. No. What was that? Daisy? No, it wasn't no, Daisy. That was someone else. It was someone else. I don't. Re- I don't remember. Uh, well, if I can re- bring her her name, because she sent me a beautiful email about a month ago. I thought I forwarded it to you of her newborn baby, and it's so cute. And and the two, uh, uh, and then the five year old and so the newborn wonderful. kind of hugging together, that's and so uh, it was just such a joyous, a, a joyous email. I just love to see people change suddenly and profoundly, and then maintain those those, those gains. Uh, it's, it's, and, it's, and, these, and these sudden changes are indeed how things work. And and in in terms of this this overall anxiety, one of the one of the things I've been very interested in, in, in and I think that's so important. And and one of the reasons why I you know I. As you know, I, I have not wanted to be a therapist. I want to understand how team therapy works and be able to help teach it. But I, I and I'm happy to do that with people, and I've done that with many people now. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to be a therapist who someone comes to every week. At least not while I'm still running my lab, because I have all these other things that I, that I need to do. But in terms of the 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 teaching of this, being able to explain things in terms of what we're trying to do in each step has turned out to be very helpful. Why are we doing things in this way? But learning about this, how the brain works, and talking with people has opened me up to this giant problem, which we're talking about as a society, but how are we going to solve it? We live in a very anxiety-producing time. And the limbic system has a job. And it's like the brain keeps us alive. The limbic system keeps us alive. The limbic system can get very overprotective. It doesn't distinguish between reality and imagination. And if we get into an anxiety state, our prefrontal cortex shuts down. Our slow thinking shuts down. Why? Because something is threatening us. And we have got to figure out how to survive this. And we all do this. We all say, oh, I'm too stressed. I can't think about that now. But if we live in a time of extreme anxiety, it's like everything gets channeled into these pathways of rapid thinking and rapid reaction and fight or flight responses. And how are we going to break through these mazes that people get trapped in. And that is one of the reasons why I, I am so enthusiastic about the discoveries of team therapy. But we do need to bring this to closure. And I had a question for you, Mark. Okay, let's go. Initiate. 
Well, let, let, let's say I'm listening to this podcast. I'm getting kind of all excited about all these things about brain function that would, would are, are so awesome and how rapid change c- can occur. But I remember this guy, Mark Noble, some world famous researcher who has this little booklet for me that's going to kind of show me what to expect and how to use this t- team therapy. And I'm asking myself, how, how can I lay my hands on this, th- this thing? Well, I, th- I think there's a couple ways that we could do this. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, a lot of this it depends on what, what you and others would like to do. From, from my point of view, you have a lot of links from the podcasts. And yep. if you mm-hmm. want to make it available as a link from the podcast for free download, that is super. That is absolutely great. I think we can do that. Just uh, bring it into the media file and then a link to it. And so that, that would be certainly one way to, to distribute it very easily. That would be, uh, that would be one way that Rhonda, between the, the Wednesday training group and the Tuesday training group, we can start distributing it to team therapists for them to right. just give out to people. I, sure. I'm going to be clear. I'm going to, I'm going to put this under what's called a creative commons license. Mm-hmm. What that means is they got, you know, nobody should copy it and pretend that it's theirs and sell it for money. It means that everybody can take it and use it and distribute it. And tra- we already have uh, somebody who wants to translate it into Spanish and hopefully we'll translate it into multiple other languages and just make it available. I, one, of the, one of your colleagues, one of our colleagues on the Wednesday group very kindly wrote back and, and thought said that she thought that the guide itself would be tremendously healing in, in the way that it was structured. And, and I hope that that's the case. So we'll make it available from there. We'll make it available. My goodness, David, if, if, if your colleagues at PESI want to distribute it to people who are on their lists for team for feeling great. Yeah, to- Mark, we have a feeling great therapy center website. We could post it on our on our website too, for people oh, for downloading. Would that would be wonderful because that's, that's the goal. The goal is that we have so many challenges in our world that are the challenges of what bring people to see the two of you and your colleagues. But I'll tell you, I have other agendas. I, There, one of them is, I work on brain development. I am appalled at the idea of prescribing children powerful chemicals that alter brain development. What do we do these days? So often, we have a situation where Johnny is acting up in class. Teacher doesn't know what to do, sends Johnny to the counselor. Counselor doesn't know what to do. So what do they do? They put Johnny on antipsychotics. And the studies that have been done on the effects of antipsychotics on brain development are really quite scary. Why? Because we're not trained, our teachers are not trained, our counselors are not trained in ways of effectively saying to Johnny, what's going on? Why is Johnny acting out? He's acting out because he doesn't have the words. Something is happening and he can't tell you what it is and our community is not trained to sit down and say what's going on. And I see the same thing at the level of so many students in, in undergraduate school and postgraduate education who have such high levels of anxiety and such levels of depression. And throughout our world with global warming and all the scary political things that are going on and economic inequality, it's a time when our emotions are running high. These techniques are so powerful that to be able to sit down, no matter what aspect of your life you're dealing with, and say, okay, what is it that's troubling me? I'm going to do a daily mood log. Let me pick a moment. What are my emotions? What are my thoughts? What do they reveal that's good about me? What are my distortions? I think can help so many people. And that is part of why I'm actually 
so engaged in doing this is I went into medical research in order to help do good for people. And the engagement with the team therapy community is so very much a part of this. So I, you know, I'm just, I'm just here doing my bit. I get the amazing pleasure of working with the two of you and all of our other colleagues and to be challenged so much and inspired so much. And, you know, here's, here's my dish to bring to the table or one of my dishes to bring to the table, because there's a whole series of these guides that will that I'm writing and we'll go on to the next one as soon as this one is launched. And hopefully this will be helpful for people who want to learn how to do team therapy, to benefit from team therapy, to benefit from these approaches in an easy way. Feeling Great is a wonderful book, but it's 450 pages. A 30-page guide is, you know, it's it's a simple starting place. And if you know how the things are working from the point of view of mechanism, you gain the flexibility to think about doing them in a different way. And then there's some suggestions in there about how to how to even make the learning more effective. Well, I just want to thank you, uh, Mark. It's it's great to to see you again. Any closer remarks there, uh, Rhonda, or questions? We can't hear you now. Uh, when we started the uh, Wednesday group, Mark emailed me and said, can I be a member of your group? And I said, no, Mark, you can't be a member, but you can be a small group leader. And I'm, and you were like, oh, no, I don't know enough to be a small group leader. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that you faced your own fear about being a small group leader, about being a leader in the team community, because clearly you are a leader in the team community, whether you're a therapist or in your role as a neuroscientist, because you've explained the concepts of how and why team therapy works so so easily and in such a way that anyone could understand it. And I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you. I uh, am right back at you, as as the cool kids say, I think. Yeah. That. <laughs> I just I just I feel so privileged in my life to have encountered this world to be so warmly welcomed into it and to be able to partake in this extraordinary gift that you have brought to the world. Analytical meditation, which is the basis of all this, goes back 3,000 years. The team therapy is such a spectacular advance, and we've only talked about such a small part of, of from the brainological views of, of what's so interesting about it. So to be associated with the two of you is one of the greatest joys of my life. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, Mark. And, and as you've said, right back at you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much. Until next time, everyone. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website, at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.